Ed Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 27th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we believe likely will be the bellwether legislative race this coming election cycle. Second, we look at the way some are starting to sharpen the issues around this coming legislative session. And third, we explain why we believe the Department of Revenue under Commissioner Adam Crum is both flailing and failing to do what it should be doing at a critical time for Alaskans. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's uh, let's get started on the weekly top three. We're going to start off today with the uh, with the next election. It's already shaping up. You can see the battle lines are going to be drawing, and one of the biggest the one of the biggest races is going to be down on the peninsula. Uh, give me your thoughts on what's happening down there. Well, must read uh, carried the story uh, early, a little bit earlier before uh, before Ben filed. Uh, but in its uh, uh, summary of what's going on, the, the weekly filings of who candidate filings uh, uh, that's carried in Alaska landmine uh, a lot of Sundays, uh, they said that uh, they had this representative Brent, Ben Carpenter filed to challenge Senator Jesse Bjorkman. Bjorkman was elected last year after defeating Republican Tuckerman Babcock. I, um, I think just in, in this, perhaps in the same way that Bjorkman versus Babcock was last election cycle. I think this election cycle, uh, 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 Ben Carpenter versus Bjorkman is going to be the bellwether uh, for where the state goes. When we saw in, in an election that saw uh, Tuckerman defeated and other uh, fiscally conservative candidates defeated, uh, we saw what that did to the Alaska Senate. The Alaska Senate came out uh, with a Strong majority in favor of spending, but not paying for it. Uh, and uh, uh, Bjorkman certainly uh, fits in that mold. Um, I I think that we're going to see the same sort of bellwether effect coming out of the Carpenter uh, Bjorkman race. Ben, uh, I think, is uh, has been a, a a good solid fiscal conservative during his time in the House. Uh, I think he's been a good chair. Uh, of Ways and Means, not sure that the other members of Ways and Means have been good members, but I I think Ben's been a good chair um, of Ways and Means uh, and has uh, and has been realistic in the proposals that he's brought forward uh, in Ways and Means, fiscally responsible, certainly in, in the proposals he's brought forward uh, in, in Ways and Means. Um, and I think uh, I think he's, you know, a, a, an outstanding candidate for that seat. I'm excited to see him uh, running against Bjorkman. Bjorkman, on the other hand, I think has been um, uh, the, the, the type of Republican that we see in the state sometimes that's a Republican, uh, but, but not very fiscally conservative. Uh, Jesse was one of those who pushed for increased K through 12 spending, uh, one who bemoans the governor's uh, 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 veto of a portion of the additional K through 12 spending that was, that was passed. Um, and Jesse's one of those who wants to pay for it in the most regressive possible manner possible uh, through uh, through additional PFD cuts uh, and 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 pushing the burden of state spending more and more off on middle 
particularly middle. Uh, I mean, sometimes we emphasize lower uh, income Alaska families, but it's really middle income fa Alaska families who are bearing the brunt of this, pushing the burden of government spending off on middle income Alaska families. Um, and I think Ben will bring some realis realis realism uh, to that race and, uh, and make it into a, 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 a race that really focuses on are you a fiscal conservative or not? If you're a fiscal conservative, what does that mean? Uh, a responsible fiscal conservative, what does that mean? Uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, issues around that. I suspect that Jesse will highlight Ben's proposal of a sales tax to uh, substitute for PFD cuts. I suspect that Jesse will demagogue that and say that Ben's been is irresponsible and Ben's trying to you know, create taxes in a state that's 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 not had taxes, uh, and try to tag him as a as a as a taxer. It's not fair. I mean, as as uh, as we've known for a long time, and is confirmed by uh, a recent ICER uh, uh, an op-ed op by uh, an ICER uh, professor. Uh, PFD cuts are taxes. They're the most regressive tax ever uh, ever proposed. To to complete the quote. Um, and they just happen to hit middle uh, and lower income Alaska families, uh, families the hardest. Ben's um, sales tax is, is still somewhat regressive, but certainly hugely less regressive than, uh, than PFD cuts uh, and much more uh, uh, spreads the burden much more across all uh, Alaskans and includes non-residents, which PFD cuts don't. So we get a, about a 10% gain out of out of shifting a portion of the burden to non-residents, um, I think Ben. I think Ben's been hugely responsible in uh, in in that proposal. So I suspect Jesse will try to demagogue it, try to you know make it out to be something it's not, try to shift the blame from him, uh, claim that he's a, a no tax guy when in fact he's the most regressive tax guy. Shift the blame from him and try to shift it over to Ben. Uh, but I suspect Ben will do a good job. I anticipate Ben will do a good job. Uh, rebutting that. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a great race. And I think it's going to be, as I said, uh, sort of the bellwether of, um, of what, uh, of what we can see, what we may be able to see uh, in the subsequent legislature when that election's over. Uh, Tuckerman had a lot of baggage, personal baggage. Uh, I was just going to ask you, as if, you know, in a post analysis, I think Tuckerman, a solid conservative, but I thought he, I thought he brought a lot of negative stuff to the race just with a track record and some baggage for sure. Well, yeah, he brought a, he brought baggage from his time as chair of the party, he brought baggage from his time as, as, as chief of staff of, of, of governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, first administration, uh, first chief of staff of the, of the Dunleavy administration. Uh, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the firings and, and all the sort of stuff that, uh, that went with that. Ben has none of that. Um, I don't think, in all honesty, uh, to be, uh, I don't think I don't think Tuckerman was also a great candidate on fiscal conservatism. He was a great candidate for spending cuts. Certainly, he had been a proponent of that in the administration, had pushed back on that in the administration, but didn't talk about you know the reality of the fact that once uh, uh, the veto, once the the uh, the, the Dunleavy administration sort of softened on those on that cutting stance. The reality that we had to have some sort of revenues uh, to uh, to avoid continued deficits now that now that we were out of uh, out of savings. So I don't think Duck, I don't think Tuckerman really fully created the the full fiscal conservative uh, picture uh, in that race. Um, ben certainly has Ben stepping forward and saying, "Look, we've got to be fiscally responsible. We've got to have you know if we're going to continue if if we're going to continue the spending and you know we have." If we're going to continue the spending, we've got to be fiscally responsible. We've got to find better ways, more equitable ways, lower impact ways uh, of funding it than uh, than using uh, using PFD cuts. We've got to find relief uh, for middle income Alaska families, which sales taxes are relief for middle income Alaska families, tax relief uh, for middle income Alaska families. And we've got to find ways to, you know, to, to do this better. We've got to find a way. His vision was we've got to find a better way of doing corporate taxes. Our corporate taxes are among the highest in the nation. Taxes on corporations. We don't tax many, but we tax some. Um, and um, and we got to find a better way to do corporate taxation, taxation to make Alaska a more 
a business friendly place. And so he was using a portion of the sales tax revenues to reduce uh, corporate taxes and sort of a tax uh, rate redesign. Um, and I, and I think that's a, I think he's, he's taken hugely responsible positions on that. I suspect, right. as I say, I suspect well, Jesse's going to push those, but he, he's got into the details. I mean, that's the thing. Ben provides you with details and drill down stuff instead of just saying we'd love to spend and then never giving you an idea of how he expects to support all this extra spending. Ben has actually taken the time to break all that stuff down. Uh, hence his proposal for the sales tax as an alternative revenue measure uh, to actually pay for some of the things they're talking about. So um, I, I think people will find him to be, again, thoughtful and, uh, and you know, having a full plan instead of just talking points, I guess. I'm going to be interested to see how that race develops in terms of how they deal and how both sides deal with that issue. I think, as I said, I think Jesse will, will, uh, will demagogue it. I think the way to, 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 to talk about the, the, the revenue structure that Ben's proposed is to say it is tax relief for middle income Alaska families and just go full bore into explaining how PFD cuts are a hugely regressive tax on middle income and lower income Alaska families and how a sales tax is tax relief is a, is a spreading of the burden to include uh, non-residents uh, in, the, in the tax burden and uh, in, the, in the revenue generation. And I and I think that's a great I think that's a great way to sell it. Um, I'll be interested to see how it develops. How Ben argues that case uh, as Jesse uh, tries to tries to sting him with the uh, with the uh, with the proposal that Ben's put on the on the on the House floor. Brad, you made an interesting um, point, uh, which we really haven't dived into in the past because normally when we talk about those being affected by PFD cuts, et cetera, um, <clears throat> you talk about the middle and lower class and. But I, I think you made a valid point when you say the ones that are being truly affected, maybe not numerically as far as percentiles, uh, but as far as the actual effect, are the uh, middle income folks because they're the ones that see all the 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 negatives of the cut. They don't the money doesn't hit their accounts. They don't have it available and everything else. Yet at the same time, they are not allowed. Uh, components of the social safety net and other expenditures that the state is giving for folks on the lower end of the of the uh, in income spectrum. So while everybody in the lower 70, 80 percentile is feeling the bite, those in the middle are the ones that are feeling it the most because they get the cut, but they don't get any of the benefits from the spending on the state side uh, for social services or social safety net stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right, Michael. And And numerically, they're by far the largest uh, group that's that's impacted. And when you break uh, 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 a population down by income brackets, you usually do it by quintiles. You have the low twenty, the lower middle twenty, the middle middle twenty, the upper middle twenty, and then the and then the the top twenty percent. So, sixty percent of of the of the brackets are middle income, lower middle middle, and, and upper middle. And you're exactly right. The, the the social safety net really applies to the low 20, but that remaining 60% that sits in the middle doesn't really have a lot of access to it. At the margins, the lower middle have some access to it, but certainly not to the same degree that the that the low 20% does. So you got 60% of the population sitting in there. And I did we did an analysis the other day uh, for one of the columns that look at what's the effective tax rate on on that on that middle income sector that middle 60 percent the effective tax rate using pfd cuts using the fy 24 pfd cuts is above six percent it's about 6.5 percent so you're taxing middle income is higher on the low 20. i don't you know the the numbers your eye goes to that big bar that sits out there when you do the quintile analysis it's higher on the low 20 but it's still six and a half percent uh on the uh, on the middle 60 percent versus about a three and a half to a four percent tax that would apply average tax that would apply if you did if you did a flat tax so you're significantly you know you have a double tax double the the tax that would result from a flat tax across the board you have double the tax on middle income alaska families not as huge as it is on the low 20 but it's still a huge it's a huge bite out of middle income alaska uh, families income and i think that's you know that <laughs> Probably I've, I've I've contributed to that heavily by you know talking about middle and lower income, but it really is the middle income families that are that are getting hit the hardest uh, by these by the PFD tax. Um, and I think I think Ben's got a hugely strong case to make, saying, "Look, 
This is the tax impact on the middle income Alaska families uh, from PFD cuts. This is the tax impact from my proposed alternative. Why, Jesse, are you opposing that? Right. Why, why, right. why, why ever would you oppose tax relief for the for the broad 60 percent of middle income Alaska families? And I and I think that's where I think to me, that's where the race will end up being. Right. Well, and I think the interesting thing is the trickle down from a lot of that when it comes to things like uh, entrepreneurship and job creation and malinvestment of extra monies that that 60 percent quintile in the middle are the ones that are generate they're the ones that are the creators mostly of small business and when they don't have the excess funds when they don't have the monies coming in to be able to to benefit and donate that that's where it really hurts the economy in the long run because of that uh, job growth business growth job creation entrepreneurship and those things are really hurting too yep the rob myers points so I mean, all those are the Rob Myers points. So the question really ought to be, how can we do it better? How can we do yeah. middle income Alaska families better? Brad, uh, number two, uh, it's uh, it's into the session. It's just right around the corner and it's already shaping up. We're seeing the battle lines being drawn. I mean, we kind of knew it's going to be a continuation of the last session, but there's still more. What is your uh, what is your thing? Well, Larry Persley, uh, who writes a, a weekly editorial for the paper he owns, the Wrangell Sentinel, uh, sometimes that, well, often that uh, column is picked up by the ADN uh, and others around the state. And this is this is one of those. He wrote a pre-Christmas opinion that said, uh, don't let the this Thanksgiving, don't let Alaska politics give you heartburn uh, was the title of it. And mostly it's about, you know, how Thanksgiving is a great time to remember and be, you know, sentimental and, and, and have enjoy family. But then he gets down to, you know, down halfway through the column and it says, I expect, th then he says, you know, don't let the, don't let the session, uh, don't let the politics uh, ruin your Thanksgiving. But then he goes ahead and ruins everybody's Thanksgiving with the rest of the column. Uh, and he says, I expect the biggest debates next session will be how much more the state should spend to support public education and how much the state should spend to increase the amount of the permanent fund dividend. That's the way it's been for years. All other issues fall away as lawmakers and the governor fight over the two largest items in this budget. It's nostalgia at its worst. It's a sad, repetitive menu made unhealthier by the governor and his supporters putting a large dividend above all else. They pledge a big PFD, bigger PFD that the state treasury can afford, knowing they won't win in the legislature, but will win with many voters. It's my cynicism acting up again, he says. What's not in this column, what's not in any uh, uh, progressive, uh, which I think Larry would be classified as not in any you know, progressive talking point is you can make it better, Larry. We can all make it better by substituting a, low, a less regressive, lower impact uh, revenue source uh, than PFD cuts. He, they don't, they don't want to talk about uh, they don't want to talk about anything other than PFD cuts. Doesn't affect them. Most of them, a lot of them, are in the top twenty percent. Uh, they don't want to talk about anything other than PFD cuts for uh, for for closing the budget. They don't want to say, "Look, we want better K through twelve in this." They, they don't want to be honest and say, "Look, we want better K through twelve in this state." And we, the advocates of better K through twelve in this state, are willing to help pay for it by you know paying an appropriate amount of of revenue. Uh, burden and adopting a measure which would shift a portion of the burden to uh, non-residents. They don't step up and say that. What they basically say is we want more K through 12 spending in the state and we want you middle income, middle and, and lower income, but mostly middle income. We want you middle income Alaska families to pay for it. We want to enjoy it. We want our Johnny to go to, to go to a, a great school, a school that's supported by higher spending. We want him to get all of the benefits that we think will come from that higher spending. We want our, our son, our Johnny to, to, to benefit from that, but we don't want to pay for it. We want to push that burden uh, off on you. And I think that's, you know, th that's the message you never, ever, ever hear from Elise Galvin and from Larry Persley and from all the other progressives out there. They don't have a sense of responsibility for what they're for to pay for what they're advocating. It's like free goods to them. Uh, and they just want, they want middle income Alaska families uh, to bear mostly to, uh, to bear the burden of it. So uh, it, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing the debate start up again. We're seeing the progressives again, do this. We want to spend more, but we don't want to pay for it uh, act. And it's just, it's just very frustrating.
One other thing I'll say uh, that was that was interesting. Uh, Matt Buxton has a column in what's the Alaska Current, uh, which I uh, uh, an online uh, column which uh, or an online paper which I read occasionally, and it says Alaska and it talks about a, 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 a committee meeting, House Labor and Commerce Committee meeting, over a proposal to reduce what 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 most people characterize as as reducing uh, the uh, tax burden on pot, on marijuana, changing the marijuana tax. The title of the column, if anybody wants to go read it, is Alaska House Committee Revises Proposed uh, Pot Sales Tax. What that, what they're really doing, I mean, we already have a, a sale, we already have a tax on marijuana. And what they're really doing is what economists would call rate redesign, tax rate redesign. They're, they're taking the tax that, that, the taxes some things that that at levels that are problematic to the to the marijuana industry and they're reshaping it into a sales tax and the issue to to spread it more broadly and to make it apply to things that are more important or or more, more relevant to the industry than than what the tax is on now and 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 they're really redesigning it 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 is it is not it's not even it's not revenue well they're trying to make it revenue neutral the, the issue is whether they can make it revenue neutral or not um, and they're trying to make it revenue neutral but it's really a redesign of rates from from one set of from from taxing one thing to taxing a different thing that that reduces the burden um on on a large number of the of the marijuana retailers and it's um I, uh, there's two things about that that's encouraging. One is they're talking about rate redesign. That's really all the debate about sales taxes versus PFD cuts is. It's rate redesign. I don't. Ben's not trying to raise additional revenues. He's trying to redesign the revenues that are coming from PFD cuts to sales taxes to a much more equitable approach that right. include that includes non-residents. It's rate redesign, tax rate redesign. And, and it was encouraging to see the House, at least Labor and Commerce, even if they didn't realize what they were what they were doing. It's encouraging to see other parts of the legislature with respect to other revenue measures talking about redesign, doing it in a more equitable way, doing it in a lower impact way. And I, and I think that, you know, if we can if we can build on that and say, well, that's all the PFD versus sales tax debate is. It's another it's another revenue redesign debate. Second thing about that about that hearing that the that the that the column covers is that we had a number of legislators. There there was a push by the marijuana industry, obviously not only to go revenue neutral, but to reduce the revenue take uh, from the industry. You know, citing the burdens of of contributing revenues to the state uh, to reduce the revenue burdens. And we had a number of legislators in that hearing who pushed back on that. And who said no? It's it's not it's not fiscally responsible to be reducing the revenue burden. They wanted to protect the revenue that was coming in uh, because of it, uh, and and that was in the first rounds when it was first talked about going down to three percent, and they finally settled on six percent. Um, but it's uh, it, it's an interesting discussion because again, that is a, just a rework of the current revenue and pulling it from a different source instead of a wholesale source. It was going out as a flat sales tax, which I think makes a lot more sense in that regard. Um, but again, uh, it, it's almost like at some point we're fighting over pennies when the big dollars are out there on the table and nobody's really paying attention to it. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, there, there really aren't the, the 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 marijuana tax really. I don't think it produces one hundred million dollars even to the state. Uh, it, it really is fighting over pennies. But the principles involved, the fact that we're talking about rate redesign, tax rate redesign. Uh, uh, is is important, and the fact that we have legislators pushing back against those who would say, "Oh no, we want we want to contribute less revenue. We'll we'll contribute some, but we want to contribute less revenue." We have legislators pushing back against against that. I think those are both good precedents to to build on. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest, uh, talking about the upcoming uh, uh, slate of discussions for the uh, uh, for the upcoming session. Obviously, you know, the PFD is going to be a huge issue. Uh, I think, uh, you know, obviously school, the school spending uh, as well. Defined benefits has been kind of quiet lately, but it's still percolating around through the House and all this other kind of uh, uh, through the legislature. 
Um, and I know that there are some out there who are just waiting for the spring to trap. And of course, the one thing we're really not seeing uh, is that there's been delayed fiscal notes and other things. We're really not figuring out how much it's going to actually cost. But I think that's really the triumvirate that we're looking at, right, is the PFD, the uh, education fund, and uh, defined benefits. I think those are going to probably be the big three. Am I, am I on target, do you think? Those will probably be the big three. We're going to have a push for child care. I mean, we're going to have the child care task force that we talked about last week that's going to right. know, is focusing on subsidies. I mean, they don't even hide it. Uh, what what they're what they're trying to do, and so there'll be a focus on subsidies. The uh, university budget is larger than it was last year, so there's going to be a push for that. Uh, there was uh, another hearing about um, uh, the the railroad um, had a hearing uh, in front of a, another House committee and was transportation committee, I think, and it was talking about you know the need for additional investment uh, in the railroad and. Uh, get, getting funds for that. So there's going to be, and, and we're going to have the cook inlet gas situation where, you know, people are proposing for tax expenditures, additional subsidies for, for cook inlet production. We're going to have a number of, of spending uh, proposals being pushed, uh, some sort of hidden like the subsidies for cook inlet production, uh, some obvious like the incre in increase in K through 12 spending, but we're going to have a substantial push uh, for spending coming uh, coming this session, and uh, it's it's encouraging. I mean, one of the things that really to me was encouraging was to see, although albeit on a small scale, but encouraging to see the members of the House uh, Labor and Commerce Committee pushing back on uh, pushing back on uh, the proposed uh, tax reduction that the industry wanted, uh, out of concern for the impact on the state's fiscal situation. So at least it, 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 it indicates that there are some members in some contexts that continue to be concerned about uh, the state's fiscal situation. And, and that pushback will be welcome uh, on both sides of the aisle. Welcome when we see uh, various spending proposals come forward uh, this coming this coming legislature. Here was my question. You know, you're talking about all this spending and, you, you know, coming around and, you know, the secret and the out in the open and, and I guess my question is, do you think any of these legislators had looked at the 10 year forecast for where the, you know, what, <laughs> what it looks? I mean, I'm just asking. I mean, with all this stuff and all this discussion about this, you know, uh, however much money we have this year, and I, I don't think it's going to be as good as they think it is, especially with forecasted oil prices and some of these other things and the drop in revenue from the, you know, from the marijuana stuff and everything else. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, it's rosy. For this year, uh, this coming session alone, but when they start throwing all these ideas around, do you think any of them have looked at the ten-year forecast to see five, six, seven hundred, one billion dollar deficits in the future? I mean, it's no, no, I don't think they have. I mean, I, if they have, they're even being more irresponsible. I mean, we ought to we ought to give them the benefit of ignorance as opposed to malfeasance of of. of if you're proposing spending in the face of, of that 10 year forecast. No, I, I doubt it. Um, I mean, we got a new 10 year forecast coming up. I'm, I'm hopeful it will be honest. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm hopeful we'll be honest, but as we talk about the revenue department, in the third segment, I'm going to be a little, uh, I'm going to be a little skeptical of what the revenue department's up to. Um, and hopefully the 10 year forecast will be honest. If you use current uh, oil forecast price, the current uh, oil futures prices, or if you use the EIA forecast prices, or you use any deck, price deck uh, out there, and you look at what's going on with, uh, with the future of Alaska production, uh, which is in terms of revenue bearing production uh, going down, continuing to go down uh, at a faster rate than, it, than, it, than I think it previously was anticipated in the last 10 year, uh, 10 year, 10 year forecast. Uh, if you look at, at the revenue production, re revenue producing barrels going down, you look at spending going up, you know, the, the deficits get wilder and wilder and wilder. And no, I don't think legislators are paying attention to that. I mean, they're paying, they barely pay attention uh, to the latest uh, oil price forecast, uh, as opposed to, you know, look, uh, look ahead at what the, what the future holds in terms of productive revenue producing levels, revenue producing production. Uh, and in terms of uh, prices, I, yeah, I we we just got a lot of we just got a lot of people who think that you know we can just spend and spend and spend. You go back to that op-ed that the the House Minority wrote, the Alaska House Coalition wrote that said we've got a surplus. 
So what's the problem with spending more on K through 12? We've got a surplus. Right. right. I mean, you, they're just, they're just, they're dealing in fantasy land. And right, it's because like it's not the worst part is that kind of stuff, especially a BSA increase, is not a one time expenditure. Okay, sure. Let's assume that we have a surplus, like you're saying, this year. What does that mean for next year or the year after that? If you're locking in this as a long term, multiple, you know, uh, ongoing expense, you know, it's not like this is one time spending you're talking about. Well, bef- and before anybody says, oh, we got a surplus, we don't have a surplus. You have a surplus only because, I, I, only because we cut the PFD. Uh, by something like 75% from statutory levels. We don't have a surplus, folks. Um, uh, and, and, and for them, it's just irresponsible, massively irresponsible for the Alaska House Coalition to go out with a, with a statement like that. So, you know, when you got, uh, but, when, but when you got legislators thinking that, God only knows, you know, they're not looking at the 10-year plan. They're not, they're not even looking at the one-year plan. They're just making stuff up. Uh, Donna asked in the chat room, I think this is a question that's on a lot of people's mind uh, because of the fact that it's an election year. A lot of legislators are up for re-election. The governor's not. Priscilla points some sticky fingers at that. Uh, but what PFD does the go- does Brad think the governor will put in his December budget? The budget is due in uh, uh, 17 December. days. Yeah. yeah, 17 days. So what what do you think? I think he'll go back to POMV 50-50. He, uh, he bounces around. <laughs> He's bounced around all these years. He'll go back to POMV 50-50. But, but POMV 50-50 still presents him a problem because we're in huge deficits even with POMV 50-50. P- the difference between POMV 50-50 and, and the statutory PFD averaged over the 10 years is about $500 million a year. So he closes, he gets about $500 million in additional revenue by putting POMV 5050 in the budget uh, as opposed to the statutory PFD, which is what he did last year. But but I don't know how he closes it. I mean, he's got to come up with something to close it. Last year he came up with the you know the the fairy dust of conservation credits uh, or you know climate change credits or whatever the heck he called right, it. Carbon credits, and, right? And and that was that was that was fairy dust. So he either's got to come up with sprinkling some fairy dust again over this budget to uh, to close that gap, or say we're going to take it out of permanent fund earnings, or or do something, or he's going to have to come up with actual revenues to help close it. But I, I'm guessing POMV fifty fifty. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest. Uh, we're going to continue. Dada says uh, most legislators consider your PFB to be be a revenue source for the government, so they will plan to spend more. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's just that's where that surplus idea came from. Welcome back to the uh, program. The final segment of the show, number three, uh, where Brad is going to point out to us the the failings and flailings of the Department of Revenue at a time when we really need solid numbers, good stuff, you know, people who are, you know, sharp penciled people in there uh, because the Department of Revenue is such a critical part of uh, funding of the state and everything else. They seem to be kind of uh, bumping around in the dark. Now, maybe it's intentional, maybe it's not. Um, I have my suspicions. Brad, what do you say? Well, Jeff Lanfield in his uh, in his weekly uh, column, Sunday column, uh, he has a, a, a piece of that column that's called the loose unit. Who's the loose unit for the week? And the loose unit is, is defined as someone who's sort of gone off the rails uh, over the edge. And this week's loose unit is current revenue commissioner, Adam Crum. Um, and, and Crum earns that, that title uh, in Landfield's column because we're six months down the road or five months down the road. And, uh, and we still don't have a new tax director. Crum fired. Uh, without announcing it, uh, just you know, one day she her name wasn't on the on the on the website anymore. Fired a uh, previous uh, uh, tax director, Colleen Glover, who was a great tax director. She was familiar with the industry, but she recognized when she came over to the state side of the tax division, her job was to enforce the rules uh, and uh, and stood up to the to the companies when they tried to you know play fast and loose with some of the rules on. Uh, on uh, on tax issues, uh, oil tax issues, and was a was a great uh, tax director. He fired her without ever explaining why he did it, um, and, uh, and and not even uh, announcing it. I mean, nobody. There was no. It was just like you said. The name just disappeared from the website. Nobody knew. 
Yeah, the only the the, the rumor out out there in the world is that uh, she got crosswise with uh, with some of the oil companies and uh, and they pressured their friend Adam to uh, to get rid of her. And he hasn't announced a replacement uh, uh, for her since. Now, some people say, oh, okay, that's what we can do without another gov government bureaucrat. But the problem is, in the interim, the deputy steps up, and the deputy in this case, uh, Brandon Spanos, is is you know is, is the textbook definition of milk toast. I mean, Colleen stood up to the industry. Colleen, you know, was was one who applied the rules as they were, uh, and and it's important for the for the Department of Revenue to do that. I mean, that's a huge amount. Even now, it's a huge amount of the revenue that the state takes is from is from oil taxes and, and Colleen stood up for for uh, for for those rules and regulations from the statutes that as the legislature enacted them and regulations as the tax division uh, had promulgated them. Brandon is a lot less um, well milk toast I think is the word. Assertive. He's not assertive. He he's not standing up for Alaskans. He's more roll over a what on yourself kind of. And you, and, and you sort of and, well round heels. I think you know I talk about Dunleavy having round heels sometimes, which is the term I used to hear, hear from all my Wall Street friends about, you know, bending over backwards to, to agree to stuff. Brandon has a case of round heels in, in, in extremis. And, you know, when industry pushes, Brandon just sort of floats back. He, Colleen leaned into it and, and, and asserted the state's position. Brandon just sort of floats back. And that's who Adam has left, left in charge um, and, and, has, and has not appointed a, a, a tax director to a, a permanent tax director to take the place. This is a time uh, that we need uh, that we need a, the strongest revenue director we have, and, or strongest tax director that we can that we can get. And the fact that he that Adam hasn't stepped up to appoint another one, uh, you know, forget that he didn't explain why he fired Colleen. The fact that 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 Adam hasn't stepped up to appoint another one is, is problematic. It's not the only problematic thing about Department of Revenue, though. In the previous under the previous revenue commissioner, uh, Lucretia Mahoney. Uh, revenue was straightforward and, and, and in with, with some of the various revenue proposals, some of the various um, uh, uh, revenue forecasts that they gave also published a fiscal model that showed the effect of various alternative revenues. For example, like closing the Hillcorp $100 million loophole, uh, increasing or reducing the per barrel credit uh, for, uh, for oil companies. Um, uh, various other forms of revenue, uh, and the, the impact of various other forms of revenue, the amount of revenue they would, they would raise. Uh, and that was fairly, a fairly standard, um, uh, step that when you had a new revenue forecast out, you had an updated revenue model that had all of these additional things that you could look at and say, okay, well, instead of additional PFD cuts, how about we close the Hillcorp glitch, the Hillcorp hundred million dollar loophole, and plug that into the revenue forecast and plug, you know, some reduction in the per barrel credits into the revenue forecast and plug in some of these other revenue steps into the forecast. And you could, you could model out, you could use what the state had given you to model out various alternative, alternative futures that stopped under Adam. We don't have a fiscal model out there right now. We have a fiscal model, but we don't have a fiscal model that has these revenue, uh, revenue steps that you could take to help uh, close the, close the gap. What the fiscal model permits you to do is say, well, what if we raised $250 million in additional revenue? What would that do? Well, yeah, but where does that $250 million come from? So we can look at the impact on Alaska families and on the Alaska economy of that, of that additional $250 million. It doesn't, it's not in the current revenue model. So it's, it, there, there are additional things in addition to getting rid of one of the, of the best deputy commissioners we had. In, in, a, in addition to getting rid of uh, Brian Fector, who was the Rev deputy commissioner under under uh, Lucretia, uh, in addition to Lucinda, rather, uh, getting getting uh, uh, rid of, of uh, Brian, getting rid of Colleen, in addition to those things, Adam Crumb's revenue department has done other things that just made it more difficult. Finally, a revenue commissioner ought to be out there saying, look, I'm not advocating or I'm not opposing, but there, here, here are some alternatives to the road we're going. Here are some alternatives to PFD cuts. Here are some alternatives to spread the burden more fairly, to include uh, additional additional revenue sources that that that, that tax non-residents for a portion of, or take have revenue from non-residents for a portion of our 
from for a portion of our of our revenue burden. Here are various ways to think about it. Lucinda did that. Uh, Lucinda did that in front of the Fiscal Policy Working Group in 2021, and she'd done it even before that. Adam, not a word, not a word is coming from a Department of Revenue about these alternatives. So you got a revenue commissioner out there who's who maybe is collecting the revenue that we're entitled to, but you don't know because he filed the ta- fired the tax director uh, and hasn't replaced it and, and is using an interim that has round heels. Maybe we're getting all of the revenue that we're entitled to, and but we're certainly not thinking ahead as previous revenue commissioners have done and as you would expect the revenue commissioner to do, as the Department of Revenue to do, thinking ahead of... Uh, uh, of of what you know where we could go to make life better for Alaskans to have revenue measures that have a lower impact on middle income Alaska families and and uh, and are more fair and more distributed across across the across the 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 universe of of potential tax base um, we just don't we don't have that with this with this revenue department and it's bad I mean this is the time we need rev- the revenue department to step up it's the time you need OMB to step up the Office of Management and Budget to get a handle on spending and, and, and keep spending under control. But it's also a time, you know, recognizing what happened in 2019, it's right. also a time that you need a revenue commissioner to step up and be doing good stuff from, from the revenue department. And we don't have that right now. Well, it would be, you know, it would make sense that a department of revenue would provide options, right? Here's options. Here are all the things that are on the table. We have, you know, you could go this route, you could go this route, you could do this type of tax or this type of revenue, which again, historically they have done in the past, but now it's like, there's only one solution. And the solution (laughs) is, I mean, really that's what it is. It it has become a, it has become a, instead of a, an, an arterial road with all these different turnoffs where you could take different branches. It's like a super highway all headed right towards the PFD. There is no uh, there is no alternatives being proposed. There are no alternate plans or levers or even proposals and no ways to even look at it, which historically they have done in the past. They've like you said, they've given you alternative options. OK, you could pull this lever for revenue or you could pull this lever and here's what it would look like. And they're not providing any of that stuff. So it seems like it's almost a foregone conclusion and we're looking at outcome based solutions. And this is from an administration. This is from an administration whose governor says I want to preserve the PFD. I want to. I want to uphold the statute, and I want to. I want to protect the PFD. And yet, he's got a revenue department that, as you say, is like creating a super highway right at the PFD, just running the PFD over because they're not giving any other alternatives, and they're potentially not even enforcing. You know, doing a good job of enforcing the existing revenue laws we've got on the books in terms of in terms of oil taxes uh, and the other existing taxes that we have. Colleen's job wasn't to create wasn't to create additional taxes. That's a policy job that's the deputy commissioner and the and the commissioner's job as well as the governor's job and the legislature's job. Her job was just to enforce the statutes as they are, not to create new statutes but to enforce the statutes as they are. That's the job of the tax director. And you don't want somebody who has round heels uh, in that job bending over backwards right. to, you know, the latest the latest, you know, brain scheme that's come from an industry financial guru about, ooh, maybe we can interpret this statute this way or this re- this regulation this way. We you don't. This is a time you don't need that at this point in time. You need somebody who's getting out there and forcefully uh, enforcing the statutes and the regulations as they are. It's almost like this whole thing is working as intended, right? The governor wants to keep his hands clean, so he brings the, I mean, the the henchmen in or whatever into the various departments and then kind of lets them just run amok. Or maybe he's just not paying attention. I mean, I don't know at this point. Does it, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter to him. But uh, the idea that somehow we, and you're right about the tax director. I was, when I was on the Fairbanks North Star Borough Assembly, we had battles every year with the oil companies uh, because the pipeline goes through the borough and the borough was a tax collector for that and everything else. And the oil companies had, you know, whole floors of sharp penciled accountants and lawyers that would tell you, oh, no, no, this is what the law says. This is how much we have to pay. And every year 
we'd have to go back in and say, no, this is what the law says. This is what it is. We worked with the state and it was millions of dollars. We're talking about millions of dollars of revenue that the oil companies, God bless them. That's what they're, that's why they hire those accountants to try and get this stuff through. But if you don't have somebody at the state level who's pushing back, like you said, and leaning into the law and saying and taking a stand and saying, no, this is what the law says, you're losing millions of dollars of revenue from those uh, situations. Yeah. And sometimes you have the oil company saying, look, you know, I, Hill Corp is 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 my particular poster child for this going. I need that extra hundred million dollars. I need that hundred million dollars from the Hill Corp loophole. It provides me an incentive and provides me money to go ahead. Uh, and uh, and invest uh, additional amounts on the North Slope. Uh, and I just, you know, I, there are reasons why I need it. And they do that. The old companies will do that certainly also when they come up with new interpretations of existing statutes or existing regs, or you have to apply uh, new sta the existing statutes and regs to new situations, which is probably as as frequent as anything else um, in this area. And and they come up and they and they and they and they say, you know, we need this interpretation because it will help us, you know, help provide an incentive for additional production. And and that's fine. You can make that argument. But the place to make that argument is in the legislature. The place to make that argument is we need a change in the statutes in order to provide us with additional incentive. Not the place you shouldn't be making that argument and the place the, the state shouldn't listen to that argument is in the administration of the current statutes. It's the tax division, the revenue division, the revenue department's uh, uh, obligation to enforce the laws as they are and to look out for the state's interests in the statutes as they are. If the industry says we need more money and we need, and we need, you know, you need, you need to give us more money to provide an incentive, then go change the law. Go to the legislature and explain why you need to change the law. But instead of doing that, they try to do it in the back rooms by saying, well, let's just interpret, we need more money. So let's just interpret this statute or this regulation to do this instead of that. And what Colleen was really good at was just standing there and saying, no, that's not what the, that's not what the regulations say. It's not what the statutes say. If you need more, go to the legislature and, and plead your case about why you need, you need more subsidies or you need more, you know, you need, you need tax relief. But, but as long as the statutes are as they are, as long as the regulations are as way as they are, this is what the state's entitled to, and this is what we're going to get. And I and I think what we're seeing with the Crumb administration, with with Adam Crumb's administration over in Department of Revenue, is is they're they're buying into this concept of ah, oh, industry needs more here and industry needs more there, and so we'll just sort of you know modify how we're how we're enforcing the law uh, to uh, to accommodate that, or we'll just lean over backwards, you know, in new situations, and we'll say ah, oh, well, okay, we'll uh, we'll we'll accept that. We'll accept that interpretation. I, it's, it, it is at a time when we need revenue most, at a time when every dollar that Adam Crumb's administration, Revenue Department of Revenue, is not chasing after, at a time when every dollar that he's not chasing after is coming out of the PFD, coming out of middle-income Alaska families through, through additional PFD reductions, at a time when we need the Revenue Department to stand up the hardest, they're standing up the least. And they're and they're you know Adam's bending over backwards to his friends in the industry to to try to curry their favor. You know I've got I've got a theory for why that is. It relates to Adam running for governor in two years and wanting the industry to back him. And so let's use in in Adam's in Adam's vision. Let's use my current my current job to curry favor with the industry so that they back me in two years when when I run for governor. That's my theory for why this is going on. But but it's going on, and 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 not having a tax director leaving it to the deputy whose, whose job is, is, is not that. The deputy's job is mostly just to run the nuts and bolts of the department. Leaving it to the deputy to make those calls uh, in, in the interim uh, is, just a, is just a recipe for disaster. Uh, wrap up here, Brad, 60 seconds before we go to, go, to, go to the top of the hour here. Well, we got a, legislate, we got a session coming up. We're going to have a lot of pressures in the session Protecting the PFD and looking at alternative measures ought to be one. Ben Carpenter's done a great job of that during the last legislature. Hopefully he continues to push that during the current legislature and hopefully that he, he finds ways to push that to, to articulate why he's doing that uh, in the coming uh, election battle as well. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on board today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. 
Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.